Welcome back to Skeptics and Seekers. Uh, this is a special uh, supplemental episode. Um, so I, I've been promising you guys for a while now, uh, I was going to go on the Right to Reason podcast with Robert Stanley um, and have a debate or a discussion with Kevin Francis, uh, who is the host of the atheist podcast Left the Valley uh, podcast. Uh, check the sources. I'll, I'll give the sources for both Robert and Kevin's podcast there. But yeah, uh, so we, we did, finally did our discussion on the subject of Jesus mythicism. It's a, it's a nice uh, quickie for a discussion. You know, it's about an hour, 10 minutes. Uh, it was a great discussion. I, I want to say thank you so much to both Robert and to Kevin for, for putting on a, a great discussion and giving uh, me some things to think about and hopefully the, the audience on SNS. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the conversation. Have a great day. All right, and today we are joined with Dale Glover from Skeptics and Seekers and Kevin Francis from the Left at the Valley podcast. Gentlemen, I am so happy to be talking to you today. Thanks for having us on. Robert, it's always a pleasure to goof off with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you've been on the show a bunch. I've been on your show a million times. Dale, you, you've been a guest before. Yeah. Uh, what, was, what was the topic we discussed last time? Um, it was the Abraham test. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. I would, I would kill my kid for Jesus. That one was crazy. Yeah, it makes me popular, as you can tell. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, I, th- I think it's important. It's, it's a difficult subject, but I, I do think it's important to, to not be afraid to discuss, you know, these important matters, even if it's, you know, it, it can get sort of touch and go at, at times and stuff like that. So yeah, I was, I was grateful that you, you brought me on for that. Oh. Okay. Okay right off the bat what do you mean important matters the abrahamic test is an important matter how is that important um well because abraham's example of faith is is an essential doctrine of of christianity you have to have faith in god in the same way that abraham did to be saved so yeah that's that's why i see it that way Mm -hmm. you and i have very different definitions of what's important but hey that's okay fair enough (laughs) who and that's kevin i'm talking to or that's correct okay gotcha okay cool and uh, Kevin, I think, boy, what, last time you were on the show, I want to say you were talking about sexual assault with, uh, that was about David Silverman. Was, was that yeah. the last time? Dude, I've talked to you so many times. It was pretty much the only time we actually came as a whole crew to on your show. We were supposed to do a show about uh, introducing us to your audience, but we ended up talking about David Silverman and sexual assault all along. So, <laughs> but we had a blast. <laughs> it's got a free flow, organic format, I guess, there. But, but yeah, it was, it was a, a, a fun discussion. I, I can't believe is that. So this is your second time on. Technically, I guess so. Yeah. That's insane. I feel like I, I talk to you every week. Well, I feel left out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know who I've always wanted to have was Nancy. No. And anybody, I'm sure all my listeners know Left of the Valley. You guys are a patron of the show. In yeah. fact, uh, yeah. so heads up there, Dale. He gives me money. Okay, all right. I, I see how it's going to be. All right. Yeah, I'm definitely clean in the moderation that way. But you can make your donation, Dale Glover, at patreon.com slash right and make a difference in the, in the skeptical community. All right, let me rush and grab my credit card. So. Good, the fantastic work that he does. He actually does a fantastic podcast. Robert, I can never praise you enough. Okay, so we're going to give Kevin a good... 30 minutes for his opening thing, and Dale, your rebuttal will be <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was expecting to begin with, so. <laughs> I think they should about making a difference in the skeptical community, but uh, Dale actually uh, uh, does a show that kind of, it, it brings both sides of the, the table together. Would that be a fair way to characterize it? Absolutely, yeah. We, we want to represent both sides on, on the issues, so it's called Skeptics and Seekers, so yeah, we have me yep. representing representing the Christian side, and then my, my co-host, David Johnson, who's sort of the bringing in the skeptical side, and yeah, we go back and forth on that, on, on an issue or something like that. Dale, I'm interested in knowing a bit more about your show. Where can I find it? Sure, it, it's up on uh, skepticsandseekers.wordpress.com. Okay. And, um, yeah, we have, you know, blogs on various issues, as well as uh, a podcast that we do each week. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're going to be starting up Season 2, Sometime in September, mid September probably. Well, yeah, congratulations. The first year is always the hardest. Exactly. Yeah, working out the kinks and all of that. Spe- especially okay. working with my partner David. Yeah, he's he's a t- <laughs> that's a joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been working out the kinks in our show for at least five years now, and we're still not done. So. Oh goodness. Okay. 
<laughs> doing it forever, man. And uh, you know, uh, Kevin, the way that I actually got introduced to Dale was from another patron, uh, Tara. And Tara and Dale have been arguing for what? For years yourself, haven't you? Um, I would I would say for about a year, but um, yeah, it's 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 just too much. Like I'm I'm letting her do her own thing. She she's hung up on on that one issue and that sort of thing. Yeah, and we were going to talk about one issue in particular today, the topic of mythicism. Uh, Dale, if you want to start us off, maybe anybody that doesn't know what mythicism is, uh, maybe just kind of a, a quick definition of that, and then your defense for the existence of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sure. So so I think mythicism, there, there isn't really one straightforward definition because there are different types of mythicists but in general um it's it's the opinion that the jesus of christianity as a historical figure never existed he, he was invented a, as like a, a myth in the same way that hercules or, or romulus might be seen to be an invented myth so it's it's sort of the denial that there was any historical figure um that lies behind the jesus of christianity um, so, so yeah, that, that's sort of my main claim here is that I, I think that we can establish that. Hold on, hold on, Dale. Oh, cutting out again. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it's, it's spotty, but I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, Dale, you want to just kind of try to pick up with, I would just start over with, uh, the, the whole thing. Okay. All right. Let's, you were going to define mythicism and then, uh, present your argument for it or yep. against it. Yep. Uh, perfect. Okay. Um, so I'll just wait a couple seconds. Okay, so so yeah, I think uh, mythicism. Th there isn't really a one size fits all definition because there are there are different types of, of mythicists out there. But um, just in general, I, I think mythicism is sort of the view that there isn't. It's a total denial that there is a historical figure named Jesus who who stands behind uh the ideas of, of the christian jesus and that sort of thing that it's you know it's rather it's based on a myth or it's an invention in the same way someone like romulus or hercules and that sort of thing are um whereas i on the other hand would hope to argue for what i call at the very least a minimal historical jesus hypothesis um so i so i sort of define that very very minimally that there was a, a Jewish man who lived, and believe it or not, I don't, I don't even think I need to add in that his name was Jesus, uh, which is kind of funny for a minimal historical Jesus. But um, minimally, I can say there was a Jewish man that, that served as the inspiration for, or, or the foundational basis for Orthodox uh, Christian beliefs and practices as outlined in the New Testament literature. Um, so, so that's sort of my goal, uh, what I'll be trying to argue for. And um, I think there are three basic uh, main categories of evidence that Christian apologists will try to use to try and prove that. So um, the first one is obviously sort of appealing to extra biblical, um, and in particular, the, the most popular is non-Christian or secular references to Jesus. Um, and then the second one is sort of looking at the Gospels as a, as a whole and, and trying to argue that they're sort of generally reliable and or provide eyewitness testimony or something like that. Um, and then the third category, which is uh, where most biblical scholars come to play, is using the historical method or historical criteria to glean elements, specific elements in the in the New Testament literature or Gospels and say, well, even if the Gospels and, and the New Testament is unreliable, at least these things are probably true about, about a Jesus who existed, a minimal historical Jesus. Um, so, so that's sort of going to be, in a nutshell, what my case is about. Um, so in, in the first place, um, we have ancient historians who do refer to Jesus. Um, for example, Josephus, um, which is, I know, someone that Kevin wants to talk about. Um, and he mentions Jesus twice in his uh, Antiquities of the Jews book. Um, and basically he references uh, certain things uh, about Jesus, about his death um, at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Um, he also has another reference talking about Jesus' biological brother, uh, James, and how he died. 
Um, we also have Cornelius Tacitus, who is a, a Roman historian, and he makes a, re uh, a reference to uh, Christus as the founder of the Christian church. Um, and, you know, sort of talking about why the, the Christians were persecuted in the time of Nero and that sort of thing. Um, so we have that category of evidence. I'm going to skip the Gospels being reliable, but uh, the third category, I think, is one of the strongest um, avenues for proving a minimal historical Jesus. It's the reason why people like Bart Ehrman and most scholars and historians do believe that there was uh, such a person. Um, so what am I talking about? So with the historical criteria, there are things like the criterion of embarrassment or the criterion of dissimilarity and that sort of thing. So um, as an example, with the criterion of embarrassment, um, there are stories where Jesus is depicted in relation to his crucifixion and in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's depicted very wimpish or, or cowardly. He's, he's afraid, he's, he's sweating blood. Um, you know, he cries out in pain and stuff like that. And this would fulfill what's called, what historians call the criterion of embarrassment. It, and that makes it more probable that these are reflecting histor accurate historical facts about what happened. And we can compare that to other Jews that, um, you know, Jewish martyr accounts of the time where, you know, the, all of the Jewish heroes go heroically to their death. Um, they're, they're spouting judgment against the pagans that are persecuting them and, and they, they're fearless uh, in going to their death. So this would be one, one example where we would use a historical criteria to argue that it, it's more probable than not that there's... Some, some historical tradition that's accurate in depicting Jesus okay. in this way. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Hey, buddy. Sorry to interrupt you. I was, I was going to jump in real quick, if you don't mind, sure. to ask, how long is this damn intro? <laughs> um, so, so that'll be, yeah, that'll be it. Then I wasn't sure how much you wanted me to... <laughs> I didn't want to stop right there. I'm just, it's a talk show, bro. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm finished then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 I feel like that was a little, that was a little over rude. I, but please, I mean, not at all. No, no, not at all. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I, I, my, my intro, so I gave the three categories. We can turn it over to Kevin on that, and then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I guess I'll make, I'll make this sort of relatively uh, brief. Um, uh, the, the, the problem with Jesus, and God knows there's a lot of problems here, uh, and, and the criteria and, the, and, the, and everything in there is... There's nothing that's first-hand. It's all second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand, hearsay, and inaccurate at best. Uh, you, uh, at the beginning, you said that mythicism was the complete denial. I think it's more accurate to say it's just skepticism, pretty much like a lot of people say. Atheists deny God. They don't deny God. They, they're skeptical about the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the proposition, and that's a better, uh, more accurate definition of what mythicism is as well. Um, there's always a big problem with Jesus uh, for Christians, although they deny it, uh, if there is a historical person, which I actually don't think there was, um, it's pretty amazing that this, this historical person never left any imprint whatsoever in historical records, aside something that was written like many, many decades later. And if there was a magic man, that's even more incredible that nobody noticed him either, outside of, you know, what the Gospels are said, uh, say, uh, say about him. And of course, they're not reliable at all, right? Mm -hmm. it, goes, it speaks also to what you were saying about your criteria of embarrassment. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you're going to start nominating things that people should be embarrassed about, then they still do because they're under religious fervor. My God, you can name about any suicide bomber or any cult out there. There's incredibly outrageous, stupid things. And people say, well, you know, they wouldn't do these things normally because they'd be embarrassed. No, they're believers. They're brainwashed. That's what they do. And Christians were no different than the Hasmic. Anyway, moving on. Mm -hmm. Well, can I can I just start off with what if we just attacked this from like one focal point? Like, what was what you had you had three main points. What which one would you say was your strongest one, Dale? Hmm. Um. Okay. So, well, um, I I think it's the historical criteria ones um, that are the strongest. But I I I just wanted to clarify something, if that's okay with Kevin. Um, so just so I know your own position, are you um, are you saying that you wouldn't make the po a positive affirmation that you can prove on a balance of probabilities that Jesus 
probably didn't exist. You're just sort of like agnostic. You're skeptical of the pro side evidence, but likewise, you're skeptical on the the negative side evidence. Like Richard Carrier would say, it's more probable that Jesus didn't actually exist. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what my position would be. I mean, I mean, it's yeah. not impossible. I'll be the first one to admit something like that, but it's I think it's highly improbable. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so. So yeah, I think it, since since you're not making a positive claim, so that means I bear the burden of proof totally in this. So um, yeah, I guess we could start with because I think uh, Robert was telling me you wanted to sort of look at Josephus. That that was something that was important evidence for you, and I actually do think this is good evidence. Um, both quotes, um, the testimonium in Book 18 that talks about Jesus. Um, specifically his death. It gives us a lot of details about uh, what he was known as. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the testimonium and also the later James passage make it more probable than not that a historical Jesus existed. Um, we could start there, maybe, if you want to give your take on that. Well, the problem I have with the, the historical Jesus is, oh, if we're, if we're going to put everything into context here, okay, um, Palestine at that time uh, was in the grip of the fervor of being under the uh, Roman Empire. Um, the Jews were always looking for a liberator, and the end-of-the-world cult fever uh, was quite common. There are plenty, plenty of examples of messianic Jews coming and claiming to be the Messiah because people were waiting for that. They were waiting for a liberator from, you know, to liberate them from the Roman Empire. And, you know, Jesus is, is not the only one. There are plenty of other failed, quote, messiahs that have come and gone before and after Jesus. But what's amazing about Jesus is of all the people that have come and gone that claim to be a messiah at that time, at that period in time, he is the only one who left absolutely nothing of a, uh, any kind of footprint throughout history, but only from hearsay from people several decades after. He didn't leave like a carpenter tools or anything, a table he made. He didn't leave, you know, writing of his own, you know, not even like a writing of close eyewitnesses at the time, which is amazing that if you are a follower of Jesus at that time, and you actually think that this is a God, and he's coming, and his kingdom is coming, you would think, that even in the, 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 the raunchiest peasant would take great care to note everything down. You know, they would, they would take his sandals and worship the sandals because they're relics. You know, they would keep everything for him, but there is absolutely nothing at all. But there are Messianic Jews out there that have done pretty much nothing but try to start a little cult and get themselves killed that somehow left a footprint in history. But Jesus, the most charismatic figure of all throughout history, did not. That is a huge, huge problem. For Christians and people that believe that Jesus actually is dead. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think that objection sort of you're taking advantage of like my Christian presuppositions or something. Like you're taking advantage of the fact Jesus is God in the flesh, and and therefore everything he did was was amazing, and he was the most charismatic person in history. I, I don't know, even as a Christian, I don't know if I would say that necessarily, but um, no, uh, you, you would have, believers would say that, right? Well, yeah, well, I am, as a believer, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know about his charisma. I suppose, I suppose disciples would say that, right? His disciples would say, well, of course Jesus is God, all right? We already know this. Yeah, but like I... Is, I is kind of curious that nobody got a memento from him or anything? Right, so that, in, the, in the first place, I would, I think that they could have had that but the jews didn't think of like this is sort of an objection why don't they keep the shroud if the shroud of turin is correct um or or that sort of thing or you know jews didn't really do that sort of thing i don't think they really kept relics in that way especially in the context of the fact that jesus was resurrected but well, the, what, the, would think, what would you think jews don't do that kind of thing because they I mean, Every other, every other person on this planet, every other denomination of not even religious, any other, other culture would do such a thing. It's a human thing to do. I mean, Elvis walks into the building, people are pulling on his scarf. Uh, I mean, if Jesus was as great a superstar as he was, what makes you think that somehow the Jews, no, no, we don't do that thing here. Why, why is that? 
It's a very human thing to do to keep a memento of people that you admire. And somehow the Jews, somehow culturally, they just don't do that. They're like the only people on the planet that don't do that. Well, it's, it was taboo for for them to keep anything associated with death. But if you're talking about like, oh, why didn't they keep? Oh, here's a, I don't know, here's a the stone when Jesus healed this guy or something. I'll keep this as a memento. I, I guess, I mean, first of all, we don't know if they did or or didn't, right? And it just got lost in history, or something like that. Um, I don't know how you're making the argument that you know. They, they didn't keep mementos from his ministry at all. Um, well, because well, from, from the first century, uh, archaeologically speaking, we have lots. We actually have a lot. It's a, it's a period uh, in history that is studied a lot because, exactly because of Christianity and because of the claim it, it makes. And yet, we can't even find a receipt for carpenter tools from Jesus. Uh, you know, you think somewhere, even a false claim of somebody saying, yeah, yeah, I've got this, this little three-legged stool here that was carved by Jesus himself. We don't even have something like that. You know, we have, we have, we, it's, it's absolutely incredible, and it's, it's such a, it blows into your face the, the silence of history towards the historicity of this man, that it makes you suspicious right off the bat. Yeah, I, I don't think we would expect, so the, the problem with the argument that you're making is you have to establish that we'd have an expectation for them to preserve tables of his uh, when he was a carpenter or something like that, and I... In the first place, those materials are perishable. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't think that they're going okay. with Jesus on a messianic mission. They're not. You know, Jesus is isn't about keeping up his profession as a carpenter. Um, they're not. They're living like Jesus abandons everything and goes out in the road to visit them in Capernaum, and he lives there and that sort of thing. So it's yeah, it just seems antithetical to what Jesus was about for the apostles to be like making you know like collector's items or something like that it just seems weird i don't think we would expect that no i think quite the opposite i think we should expect that because like i said any other uh figure in in, in history whether divine or not people have done exactly that and from a, the, the wide variety of cultures that we have i think what's amazing is we're claiming here that somehow the jews wouldn't do that because it's somehow taboo that's i think that's ridiculous that stretches the imagination right there i think somewhere down the road people would say you know hey you know i've got i've got something here and people throughout there's been a huge industry throughout history of people doing exactly that you know it's like if you take hercules for example you know if people used to do these trinkets and say oh yeah this is a trick when hercules uh fought the hydra or something like that but for jesus for some reason there's nothing like that at all you know <laughs> okay well well there are you admitted that there are tons of jewish false jewish messiahs around yes. that time Bar Kokhba, for example, who's a little bit later on, do we did his followers keep mementos and that sort of thing? Do we have mementos from their ministries and, and that sort of thing? Well, his ministry was fairly small, but he did leave a footprint throughout history. This is the the point is it's not the memento. The point is is the memento creates a footprint, and that's that that's just one of the ways you can create a footprint throughout history. You know, the, the, this other Messianic Jew did leave something that attested to his actual existence. Jesus, all we have is the four Gospels, and let's face it, there's really one of them, which is the Gospel of Mark, right? And then, the, 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 of course, the uh, Luke and uh, Matthew are based on it, and then John, of course, goes right off the bat uh, into craziness. And, and that's about as much as we have. And then we have hearsay, which, of course, we know that they were actually tampered with by the early church, in a lot of the uh, a lot of writings, even the gospel themselves were tampered. I mean, it's 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 so. Oh God, how do I how do I put this into words? It, it's so it 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 reeks of charlatanism so badly, hmm. you know. And, and, and I think that what people are are refusing to look at it with that skeptical look because because it brings them you know it, it challenges their faith. And I think this is this is what keeps the the myth of Jesus alive. The same way that. You know, Tom uh, Thomas Thompson in the 70s debunked uh, the, the the myth of Moses, but yet to this day people still believe in Moses, even though it's been clearly debunked, because you know people like to hold on to this. You know, they don't want to see their king dethroned. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. In the first place, I think this is an interesting take on the no contemporary um, witnesses to Jesus. So mostly, usually mythicists bring that up in the sense that there's no 
no historians of, of his time mention him or something. So the, this m memento aspect is interesting, but yeah, I, I still see it as, as just suffering from the same problem. You're reading an expectation that I don't think you can derive based on later Christian tradition in, in the medieval period or even dark ages where they were relic hunters and that and that sort of thing um given a first century jewish palette you know that's that's not what they were about and that's not what jesus ministry was was about he had very little in the way of possessions and that that sort of thing so it's yeah i don't know where you would expect them to be coming up with like a, a table or something that jesus kept and have that preserved perfectly well, we, from we can agree that the one thing they did keep uh, was writings. Right? We, I think we could agree on that, right? Um, Scriptural writings. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like later on. Court, right? I mean, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. So we know we, they kept some kind of record, or at least tried, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So do, do, is it, uh, do, you, do you think that, of course, we haven't found anything from his actual time, uh, yet, it's not impossible that we could find something, but you you think there is something out there that's like, I don't know, from the hand of Peter himself uh, that's possible for us to, to discover at a later date? Um, well, of, of course, anything's possible. Um, I, I think it's possible we could find like a, a random, you know, letter or something like that from someone just walking by and they witnessed... Jesus doing a miracle or heard one of his sermons, if we're doing the minimal historical Jesus thing, and yeah, oh yeah, I was, you know, heading by uh, Capernaum the other day, and I heard this guy speaking in the synagogue or something, like we, that's definitely something we could find um, yes. that, that's out there. And that, that, that would actually be a footprint throughout history, and that would actually be something. Right, but we do, we do have footprints, even if they're not contemporary, because it's it's not we wouldn't have to expect um contemporary witnesses to be preserved so for example with the shroud of turin i i could say because i i don't know if you know or not but i do think that's authentic so i could say that i do yeah um so i could say that they did preserve that but look at the way they treated that the jews specifically didn't mention it it was something that they they got rid of and if you believe the Edessan theory and that sort of thing Jesus had risen from the dead. They had Jesus dwelling in their hearts. They, they didn't need physical mementos of, oh, I need to remember the time uh, Jesus healed the blind man and let me keep this little rock that, was, that I was sitting on or that was beside me when he did that. Um, yeah, this, this is why I just don't think it's a reasonable expectation to... You know, no, but you would agree that if, if these people were followers of what they thought was a divine king <laughs> that was coming to save their soul, they would at least take the, the chance, or I should say the, the, the initiative, of recording everything he did. I think, I think you would agree that at least to pass the prosperity to prosperity to people, other people, or at least spread the message correctly. I think you would agree with that, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, the only problem is it's, it's not entirely clear that they would have had this crystal understanding uh, certainly i i don't think during his ministry the apostles or disciples at that time thought he was divine i think that came later after the resurrection um and they sort yeah they started putting things together jesus ministry wasn't clear i mean they were confused about his mission all the time so yeah i, I don't think they would have treated it the way you did uh your thinking but it's also possible that they did take the occasional notes or someone took notes um, of some of his speeches and that sort of thing and it circulated. Cer certainly that's what a lot of Bible scholars think Mark was doing with Peter's um, notes, or Peter's uh, speeches and sermons. Um, so yeah, of course it's possible, May maybe they did, but nothing we have survived unless it's through the oral tradition or maybe those notes got incorporated in some way into a gospel. Mm. And then the old tradition is another good point you bring. There seems to be no actual um, uh, agreement as to uh, what Jesus actually looked like or how he was physically. And that I find uh, very interesting as well, especially if he's supposed to be such an important figure. You take, for example, Hercules. You know, uh, there's an old tra tradition that Hercules uh, wore a certain size shoe, and they do that because they knew that one of the, uh, the, the 
the rumor was, or I should say the legend was, that one of the first Olympic stadiums was a certain number of times the size of his foot. So now they realize that mm-hmm. Hercules probably uh, was a size 42 European, which is, I think, a size 11, I think, in, 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 uh, in, in American. So, so, I mean, there was not even something like that. For Jesus, I mean, there are depiction of Jesus in the past, and the depiction of Jesus being with short hair and no beard and a magic wand, you know. And then there's, of course, the traditional uh, the depiction that we see here, which, of course, was an invention of the uh, uh, the Borgias and the Pope, uh, uh, San Cesare Borgia, apparently. And you know, it's 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 interesting that you know, for such an important figure to his followers, like I said, it's it's again incredibly silent. Uh, 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 about about anything about him, anything at all. I mean, it's, it's uh, even what he says uh, or where he goes is is challenged from one gospel to the next. Uh, you you would think on such an important fear uh, for his followers, they would be much more precise than this. And the idea of the wall, you know, no, they didn't because they, they thought it was the the end the end of the world. I think doesn't really hold any water. Okay. Um... So in terms of what he looked like, so again, you're confusing sort of Gentile and Jewish standards. So we we know for a fact that Jews didn't really get into um, talking about appearances or physical appearances that much, especially for especially when it relates to the divine, right? That's idolatry to them and that sort of thing. So I, again, I don't think we would have an expectation for them to be saying. I, I, I don't Jesus. understand why you would say that this is against Jewish tradition. I really don't think it's against Jewish tradition for a Jew to say, "Well, yeah, Jesus was about six foot two. I really don't think it's against Jewish tradition to do to say something like that. It's 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 anecdotal information, but it's something that shows that you know there was something there instead of saying, "Oh, there's this vague notion that somehow Jews don't do like the rest of the planet and can't do a simple descriptive of what they saw because somehow it's taboo because of." some kind of unknown Jewish tradition. I don't understand that. Okay, well, can you name a Jew? The Apostle Paul, do you believe he was real? Um, I I don't have any reason to think he wasn't. Okay, okay, you worded that carefully. Um, When, how long, when do you think uh, we get our, we do have a physical description of him, but it's much later. Why, Why didn't, he was an important figure, right? He was an important Jew. Um, even going around to Gentiles, why didn't they describe him early on? I mean, he was an he apostle. He wasn't that important at the time he was alive. He was trying to convert people to, to what he was doing, but, I mean, he wasn't an important figure. I mean, you're comparing Paul, which is like a, a man, to supposedly the Son of God. I think there's a level here in what's important and what's not, right? Yeah, I mean, but the, <laughs> the Son of God thing... So, once you, so the reason I was being hesitant is because I, I was... I thought you were trying to say during his ministry we would expect people to write notes describing him or something, but once they realize he's the son of God in the flesh, there's a divine aspect to it where they that would be idolatry. They wouldn't describe um, the appearance and that sort of thing. They, they're they against any kind of connotations that would um, imply idolatry or depicting God in terms of a physical appearance or something like that. So. It, and and it's secondly, even if to the people that uh, that basically worship another god. Uh, so sorry, I missed the first half of that. But idolatry worship will apply more to people describing or uh, for another god instead of that one. Well, it would, but also you like there's this notion God is we we can't even represent god like the the jews couldn't make a statue of yahweh and and worship that that was idolatry because the whole notion is god is supreme he he is sovereign over creation he he made everything everything in creation nothing in creation could represent him this was one of the key differences that distinguished jews uh from the gentiles at at the time in the first century it's it's one of the reasons why Gentiles were so intrigued um, by the Jewish faith and and sort of leaped in droves to become Christians and that sort of thing. It's one of the things that really marked them out. But but it's also, also very convenient, isn't it? Convenient? Yeah, uh, it's convenient when you have this forces that you can't really describe. Then you can't really because as soon as you mm-hmm. start describing something, you start finding flaws. But if you got something you can't really describe, then there is no flaw to it, is there? 
Yeah, well, that, that's that's true. Um, I don't think that was their motivation. Like this goes back to the Old Testament, right? I don't I don't think it was their motivation to, you know, avoid um, dis describing specific things about God out of concern. Of, oh, well, if we describe this, it could be falsified. I, I don't think they thought that way back then, um, really. So, and certainly they do they do describe certain attributes of God. Um, that, and those could be falsified. They describe certain actions of God. That was the second thing that distinguished Jews, God's actions through salvation history, um, which was quite... Oh. Sorry, it's, uh, no, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's oh. interesting that you said, you know, they describe certain attributes. Wouldn't describing attributes be the same thing as describing characteristics? I mean, if, you, if you're describing somebody's appearance, isn't that describing an attribute? That, that's correct. It, that is an attribute or property, but for some reason it's part of the Jewish religion that they don't like to mention those specific properties. They don't like to depict God. It's, it's somehow seen as limiting God, right? This is why there are verses saying, if you can't see God's face or you'll die. He's just so much, his glory is just so great. That's um, because Ju Jesus had that really big Jewish nose and he was embarrassed by it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think that is it. There you go. Well, there, there's your answer. <laughs> what if you do, guys? Don't just grab my nose when you're writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um but yeah there, there could be any any number of reasons it, it another thing it, it could have just been circumstantial like they they just didn't get around to describing it um certainly even gentile christians who didn't have these hang-ups they didn't describe paul's appearance until centuries later you know being knock kneed and and bald and, and that like our, our first depictions of paul come from the sixth or fifth century a.d um, so it's just historical circumstances. It just happened again. It, I don't think you can prove that we would have an expectation um, that they would definitely describe his physical appearance. Oh, he had a brown beard and blue eyes, or brown eyes, or stuff like that. Like I just don't think you can prove that we should expect that. Um, well, I, I, this is where you and I all disagree because I think I think it's an all too human thing to do, especially when you're describing. You know, uh, and you try to convert people, then of course the more the more of a, the more precise you can be in your descriptive, the more real your story becomes. If you come up with a vague notion, uh, you know, all of a sudden people find flaw. Uh, uh, they, they they can't really uh, they can't really find flaw with it. So therefore, it's it's always it's a safe thing to do, right? Uh, you, even in modern mythology, you take something like Star Wars. You know, you describe the Force as some some thing that's nebulous. But then, as soon as people describe the Force as some miniature creatures, mini chlorians in your blood, that becomes ridiculous, right? <laughs> so you have right there the, the exact same thing. As soon as you go too much into a descriptive, then it becomes it takes away the magic. And this is this is why, personally, I think, and it's only my opinion. I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of religion try to keep things vague, because you know, as soon as the as soon as you try to get precise in your description, and people kind of need that. Uh, all of a sudden, your, your 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 theory or whatever your product you're selling falls apart really quickly, especially in the light of what all we do that we know today. Do you, okay, so but comparing other ancient historians, like we just talking about historical personages, we many times they recount the details, what's important to them, what they did, and and their significance. You know, if you're talking about Roman historians, they'll talk about historical personages and their significance to Rome um, and Roman history and that sort of thing. But they they don't always describe in detail the physical appearance of everyone and stuff like that, even though they're extremely important, um, even seen as God. I think there are even some accounts of gods where they don't physically describe it. I'll, I'll need to look up the specifics on that. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's just... Quick, quick question for you, Dale. Sure. Um, do you think you know when Jesus was uh, by the story there, brought to the Pharisees for the quote unquote trial? Do you really think that the uh, head of the, 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 the head of the Pharisees in the middle of the night would have been woken up just to try some Jewish Messiah? Do you really think that would have happened? Um, so it's not usual practice. Um, so I, I get the background knowledge would be that that's not the way things normally done. It, it shouldn't have been done that way, but. Again, we, we have to 
say if I'm in a defensive position there, there there were exceptions to the rule. It's, it's the same yeah, as saying it would have been an exception if the character that they're trying is of incredible importance, right? Yep. I mean, if it's, yeah, if it's a really big deal and a big figure. Then I guess that yeah, you wake him up in the middle of the night and say, "Oh my God, this, you got you got to come and do this." Okay. Well, this is, of course speaks, of course, again to the footprint of history. If it's if Jesus is such an important character that the priest in the middle of the night has to be woken up to do a trial in the middle of the night, which would never happen if he's that important, then why the silence of history yet again? Why nothing happened? Why is there not even a descriptive of the that trial? There's not even a descriptive of that trial. There's not even a court record of that. It's, you would think there'd be something if it was that important, if he was that important of a character. So so the Jews didn't think of him as being that important of a character, but the, it was more the circumstances surrounding him that prompted was, the fact that they was, needed was, to was, get... It was important enough to do a trial in the middle of the night, right? Yeah, but it, it's not like they're like, wow, this is the, the Son of God, this really is the Messiah, Let, let's get him, or something like that. They, they just thought he was a Jewish nobody, a rebel... Rouser, well, right? More than just a nobody. If you're doing the trial of the middle of the night, he was so he was a threat, obviously. Yes, uh, he was a th- big enough that warranted that trial in Pronto, and you would think there'd be some kind of record of that. Say, oh, you know what? We tried this guy today. His name is Jesus. He he looks like a beggar. My God, I can't believe we, you know, there's actually From nothing. There's even you know a a, a, a role, a scribe, or anything about that. No, but there, that, that's, there, the, that's another interesting thing. Yeah, but there 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 is. So like, there's nothing that we have that's been preserved today. We've lost a lot of the the records and that sort of thing, but I think that they did have records. The Sanhedrin would have kept records of that. Um, certainly Pontius Pilate would have kept records, and, and Christians reference these. Obviously these works are lost today, but it, you can't go around and claim, oh, there's no one wrote about them at the time. You're just assuming that. We the All the evidence we have indicates that they did, um, and that's that's where I go to Josephus or Cornelius Tacitus, for example. Um, I think that they did use... So with Josephus, he was in a position to know. He would have known the head honchos, you know, maybe late 40s, late 50s. He would have been old enough to understand. He would have had access to eyewitnesses and heard the Christians going around making their claims. He would have uh, probably asked around, like, whoa, what, what is this about this Jesus guy getting crucified and all of that. Um, he was a scholar. He would have had access to to the Sanhedrin records on the, of the court. Um, so I, I think it's very strong that if the Josephus quote, for example, is true, then it's based on some kind of records. Um, and certainly government, in terms of Tacitus, the governors had to keep records. They They would have kept a record of Jesus being crucified since Tacitus mentions it later on, and we know for a fact he did consult various imperial records um, in reporting his history. He was very scrupulous. He was known as the best of all ancient historians, and he researched in detail very minor matters. Um, so I think he, he had access to the not just the imperial archives, but the archives of the Senate, which included letters from the governors, like Pilate. Um, and we can also prove that Tastus would have had a motivation to look into Jesus specifically because it fit uh, some of his interests in what he called quote unquote pretenders. Uh, pretenders specifically who claimed to rise from the dead. Uh, that was just a fascination of his or a quirk of his nature. Um, and there is also evidence that the Emperor Domitian, uh, his niece and her husband had converted to Christianity um, in the 90s. So this would have prompted Tacitus to again take an interest if the imperial household is getting mixed up in this thing. So, yeah, like, just because these sources aren't contemporary, I, I think we can establish that there is a chain, a, a link um, between the eyewitnesses and these people later reporting on it. Does that make sense, sir? Robert, do you want to give him a chance of, did it break up? Oh, did I break up? Well, he did for a while, there. I'm just wondering if Robert, what Robert wants to do with this. The, the bad audio throughout that? Yeah. Yeah, I was I was kind of debating on whether to interrupt you or not. It, it'd probably be, be better if you just did your, your response again from scratch, if you could, if you remember kind of where you started it. Yeah, you were at Tacitus when it started breaking up. So Tacitus. Okay. Um, 
so, so yeah, in, in terms of Tacitus, um, again, assuming that's his quote um, and that sort of thing, which is a lot less controversial than the Josephus one, but um, with him, he, we know for a fact from other places that he did consult official records and archives. He, um, he consulted memoirs. He consulted not just the imperial archives, but the Actus uh, Senata, I think it's called, the, the Senate's archives, which included correspondences and letters from the governors and reports from the governors, which certainly would have included, you know, the execution of someone like Jesus. Um, and with Tacitus in particular, I, I was arguing that he would have had, uh, there are at least a couple reasons why we would expect he would want to even look into Jesus in the first place. So the first is he had a, a quirk where he was interested in pretenders, people that claimed to have risen from the dead or that sort of thing. And, and also the Emperor Domitian's uh, niece uh, apparently converted to Christianity in the 90s. So again, the imperial household is caught up with this thing. So that's another impetus that makes it more probable than not that Tacitus would have looked into what is this Jesus thing about and would have come across the records that did survive it at that time, uh, even if they're not available for us today to read Pilate's reports or letters or, you know, any correspondences in the Senate or stuff like that. I think, I think we can agree here, both you and I, that um, conversion does not make anything true. I mean, yeah. Uh, if, 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 yeah, so to, even if Tacitus and his family decide to convert, it has no bearing on the veracity of the story. Now, I can't really speak too much as to the methods of Tacitus. I, you need somebody more educated than me for, for that, somebody like David Fitzgerald. Uh, but, you know, some, somebody like Josephus was basically reporting what was widely claimed by Christians at the time. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's nothing that was extremely new. If Josephus had been writing on, I don't know, Romulus, he would have been written the same kind of story, you know, and Romulus, you know, there were statues built in his honor, and there were apparently battles that were fought by him, and blah, 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 and, and he founded Rome, they even marked the calendar after him, and, but that doesn't make the guy any more historically true than uh, any other figure like Hercules, or Jesus for that matter. Uh, so I think we got to be really, really, really careful as to uh, put um, human aspirations and what we want to happen and to, to say that's definitely um, good enough to make historic, uh, a person historically uh, there or not. Okay. Um, okay. So, so in the first place, um, what you said about Tacitus, I, I recognize that neither of us are scholars. We're just laymen and that sort of thing. But what I'm saying, um, and just to clarify, Tacitus wasn't a Christian. He, um, I was saying the the emperor Domitian, uh, his niece and her husband converted, so that provided an impetus. But the the point about Tacitus, I'm not getting my my opinions here from Christians or apologists or from even biblical scholars. I'm getting it from actual Roman historians who specialize in Tacitus. So, you know, I, I compiled a list of about nine. Uh, people like Ronald Syme from Oxford. He's a, a Tacitian scholar. He's an expert specifically in Tacitus. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Martin or Michael Grant, um, Ronald Meller. Um, so, so these are some of the people that I sort of looked into when I was researching Tacitus. And, they're sort of backing me up. So it is based on secular research. Um, your point your point about Josephus, though. So, um, okay, shoot, I should have took better notes. So, so the reason, <laughs> so yeah, you made a good point on Josephus. I, I forgot what it was, but it, I'm appealing to this as, as the criterion of enemy attestation. So I, I, Josephus wouldn't have been likely to back up um, Christians just, unthinkingly and the reason he has values because above all he was in a position to know better um so he, he wouldn't just copy like you know it was recent history he wouldn't just oh the christians say uh, jesus was crucified by pontius pilate i'm just going to report that especially when he knew better that no jesus is just a myth there was no guy um you know i i talked to the freaking high priest himself and no that's complete rubbish there's no guy named jesus what are you talking about he 
we never crucified anyone or something like that. So this is why it indicates because he was in a position to know better, including eyewitnesses who would have been on the court that crucified Jesus. And, and then he is telling us this happened as historical fact. That's where it gets its strength from. That It's this criterion of enemy attestation. If it wasn't true, then Josephus wouldn't have reported it as though it was historical fact. Uh, now, obviously, ancient historians are kind of iffy when they report ancient uh, events like Romulus or Hercules, stuff like that, they tend to be a lot looser in, in the genre of ancient historiography. But they tend to be a lot more solid when it comes to, and this is a, a generalization, but when it comes to recent events, and, and this would have been a recent event where Josephus would have been in a position to have access to eyewitnesses and records, he, he would have been in a position to know better, and he wouldn't have just bent over for the Christians to say, ah, let me just give this to the Christians. Okay, Jesus was crucified. Um, so that, that's... Hold on, hold on there, hold on. Josephus never talked to any eyewitnesses. There was nothing that that shows that Jesus that, that he talked about two eyewitnesses about Jesus' existence. Quite the contrary, he says the one they call Christos, I believe, is one of his lines. You know, by referring to what Christians who were the one they call Christ. Uh, I mean, he he's basically reporting hearsay. You see, he didn't. He, I don't think Josephus went in there and did some research like you're claiming here and actually spoke to some of the witnesses, the supposed witnesses of Jesus' life. Um, so, do you mean Tacitus with that one, or? No, no, Josephus. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe you just said it wrong, because he uses Jesus. He doesn't call him Christus. That's that's Tacitus. But um, So th there are two passages. So what I was saying with Josephus being an eye, he was privy to the eyewitnesses. He, he was alive when the people that would have been on the court, or the Sanhedrin, um, who actually crucified Jesus, he would have had access to them. Um you know, about a decade or so after. He was born in around 37 AD, so that's about seven years after Jesus died. Um, so sometime in the 50s, he would have been old enough to to understand. We, we know that he was involved. He was in a priestly family and, and started getting involved in his um, profession at the age of 18 or very early on. Um, so so that's that's what I was saying there. Um, yeah, if you're not... Your your point seemed more towards Tacitus, but if you're going about Josephus, what do do you get what I'm trying to say? Like he he would have had access, and oh yeah, here's the other thing with Josephus. Remember, it's not just that one passage, the Testimonium Flavianum. There's also the one that I think is stronger evidence. It's a much shorter one in Book Twenty, where he talks. He says, and then there was uh, James, who was who had his brother Jesus called the Christ. That and talks about how James was killed. Josephus would have been an eyewitness for that. Uh, he was around in the 60s AD when, when James was was martyred. So, yeah. yeah there's a dispute whether or not when the, the passage says James the brother of Christ, if James was actually a blood brother of Christ, or the brother of Christ referred to a person that was part of the quote-unquote cult. You know, you were a follower of Jesus, you were a brother of Christ. Uh, there is some dispute about that, because I think it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, going back to the fervor here of how people you'd have the brother of Christ there and yet people don't <laughs> mm. you know he'd be like a prince essentially right <laughs> if, if Jesus is the, the, the son of God then his brother is pretty much like a prince but no yet again he's he's an unknown, an unknown character as well until Josephus Josephus mentions him uh, so anyway uh, there's some dispute about that God knows if we'll ever find out the answer to that yeah if I can jump real quick sure um we're coming up right on our hour mark, and I was thinking that uh, if you had any further points about this particular uh, uh, facet of the conversation, it would be awesome if we could kind of wrap those up and then get to both of your closing arguments. I, I think that uh, Dale got to start, uh, so it'd probably be fairest if Kevin got to finish. For sure. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, well, there there is one uh, last thing. So another argument I, I made was about the criterion of embarrassment and and you at the beginning of the show mentioned something about mu Muslims also do embarrassing things um, well that's just Muslims pretty much <laughs> and, and all religious <laughs> he adherent. <might> do embarrassing things. <laughs> yeah um, but the, the the point yeah I'm not I'm not sure how that's relevant like what 
what do you mean? Like they, the fact that modern religious adherents will do things that may seem embarrassing. Uh, again, it would have to be embarrassing to them, but that that would indicate they truly believe this is the case, right? They're reporting accurate. And there's a difference in that the apostles were, again, like Josephus, in a position to know. Um, they were eyewitnesses, uh, presumably, to this. And since the report... Go ahead. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying essentially is, yeah, I have no doubt that the disciples truly believe mm-hmm. in what we're claiming. I don't think there's any uh, there's any problem with that. Okay. But that is no bear on the truth at all. Uh, just because you truly believe that Elvis is still alive doesn't mean nothing. Uh, just because you truly believe that Allah is watching you doesn't mean anything either. Uh, truly believe or to the point of being embarrassed still doesn't mean anything at all, at all on, on the, the historical front anyway. So I, I think it's just a very weak argument. What, I think it, it works in the case of mythicism, right? Because it, they're, they're reporting embarrassing details that they saw with their eyes. They saw Jesus acting like a wimp in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they would have said, what what the heck? This is not like in the Book of Maccabees where we have the Maccabee brothers being heroes or, or Rabbi Akiba and, um, and that sort of thing, all all acting like heroes in the face of death. And yeah, like it, it, it argues against that. That wouldn't be on mythicism. That doesn't make sense. They wouldn't make up or invent an idea like that. It, it makes more sense that no, they, they actually saw their their leader Jesus acting this way, and so they regrettably recorded it down and said, yeah, he, he's he was sweating blood. He was scared. He was he was you know yell, yelling out in pain during the crucifixion and that sort of thing. Well, I think you and I disagree on that because I think it just makes for good storytelling. You know, no matter who the hero is, even in a modern story or even in a movie, there's always that moment where the hero doubts himself, where the hero kind of falls and then he rises back up. You know, it just makes for good narrative, good storytelling. Okay. So I'll if, get, I'll if we my... think that it's not an eyewitness and it's just a good story they're telling, yeah, there is a moment where Jesus is unsure himself, you know, until he triumphs. Gotcha. You know, there's always that, you know, to leave you with bated breath, you know, what's going to happen? Yeah, well, it's, it, I'll, I'll let this be my last word on this, to be fair, and give you the last word, but on, on the good storytelling, that that's the point, it, it's not. So this sort of illustrates the point of where you, mythicists, I think, bring in modern assumptions or expectations that have no bearing on the ancients. My, my expectations are actually based on Jewish historical texts. We have about five of them. Um, that I could look up here if, if you want. But to save time, I, I'm basing what we would expect on act- what we know about ancient Jews of the first century BC and AD um, and how they told a good, what they considered a quote-unquote good story about their messiahs or hero figures. And, and they, they didn't think it was good storytelling to depict your messiah as, as a wimp uh, going to their death. They thought it was good storytelling to... You know, the, the heck, you're going to burn, pagans. You, you think you're getting the last laugh? No. It, you know, there's even ridiculous stories where they get their tongues chopped off, and yet somehow they're still spouting condemnations towards these guys and stuff like that. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's my last word, is that we, we have to be careful in how we calibrate our expectations and base it on what we know from historical documents and, and what we know historically from the period. Interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll let you have the last the last word there if you like. So for for me to conclude there, Robert. Yeah, I, I was thinking, uh, Dale. Why don't you go ahead and kind of give us a conclusion of your arguments in a more or less short uh, format, and then Kevin, if you want to go ahead and close this out, and then I'd I'd love to hear from both of you about where people can find your content. Gotcha. Um, so so yeah, I just want to say uh, thank you to both Robert and Kevin. I I thought this was a great honest conversation and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, there was actually a couple couple new angles in there that I hadn't considered, such as with the, the memento uh, type argument. So I thought that was an interesting thing to go over. Um, and sort of recapping, so I, I think in terms of the categories, we covered sort of the first and third, which is what I was trying to get to. So the, you know, evidence from non-Christian historians like Josephus and Tacitus. Um, and we sort of looked at okay, well, where are they getting their information? And I think I've established in both cases that there is historical evidence that makes it more probable than not. They were basing this on reliable information that goes back 
to the historical events themselves. It's not just hearsay. It's not just, oh, they heard it off the street from a Christian and wrote it down type thing. And then the other aspect, we kind of went back forth on the historical criteria, namely through the criterion of embarrassment. And yeah, I think we just need to be careful in, in how we um, adjudicate the evidence. And, and this goes both ways, because I think Christians are sometimes guilty of using the criterion of embarrassment uh, sloppily. And, and they read in their expectations, oh, well, this, of course, would be embarrassing, but it's not necessarily embarrassing. So, you know, mythicists like Richard Carey have, have written th their book, Proving History, dealing with raising some important cautions on this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I think you need to be careful in how you use it, but when it's used properly, such as the way I have, calibrating our expectations and our knowledge of what would actually be embarrassing to an ancient Jew of the first century using historical evidence from the texts themselves, then it can be a useful thing in, in proving a minimal historical Jesus existed. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Neil. That was a great uh, talk, by the way. I really uh, respect your, your angles and your research you did there. I think you, it proves that you're quite the, uh, the scholar. Good, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to divert here for a second. You just bear with me. I love dinosaurs. I've always loved dinosaurs. Kevin, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. My favorite dinosaur as a kid was a T-Rex. Everybody loves T-Rex. Everybody knows T-Rex. Uh, as, as a child, I rode this dinosaur into battle. I fought against him. He was my buddy, right? Years ago, the image of T-Rex changed. Experts came along and said, T-Rex was maybe not the lion of his era. Maybe he was a scavenger. That hurt me. I didn't want to see my buddy dethroned. I don't want to see T-Rex be just a big turkey vulture. I want him to be the lion that he was in my childhood dreams. This is how Christians feel about Jesus. They don't want to see Jesus dethroned. They believe in him. They need him. And they will fight tooth and nail to keep him. We know more about Romulus, about Hercules, about Buddha, about all these fictional characters or the, you know, throughout history, but we can't seem to find anything about Jesus for some reason. Why is that? That's, that's a big, big mystery that we need to solve. And the, the quickest answer to that is, well, maybe Jesus is also a mythical character. You know, at, at a time when he needed, people needed to believe into something. Maybe it was a composite. We don't know. But to point out, to say, yeah, of course it was a historical character, I think, is rush. Just because there is a New York doesn't mean that within it lives a Spider-Man. And just because Nazareth exists doesn't mean that Jesus was there amongst them, too. And I think we need to bear that in mind. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, Dale, tell us how we can find your content. And Kevin, if you want to follow that up thereafter. Yep. Uh, so, so my uh, blogs and podcasts are on uh, skepticsandseekers.wordpress.com. Um, you can leave a, a comment or feedback on the website, or you can email us at uh, skepticsandseekers at gmail.com. Okay, and you can find us at our Wank Adventures at letterway.com. You can find us on any, pretty much any podcast distributor out there. You can find us at letterway.com, uh, on Facebook, on uh, Twitter, at LATV Podcast. You can send us an email at leftadvalley at outlook.com, or you can just bother Robert, and he'll just send you my way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, last question, uh, just before we go, what would change your mind? Uh, Kevin, if you want to start, and then Dale, if you want to finish, and we'll, we'll end on that. Um... What would change my mind if Jesus was a historical person, a person that actually existed? Yeah. Um, a, a relic of some kind, his bones, uh, you know, uh, something that he carved, something, you know, that, you know, uh, a sandal, a, a writing from him, a writing from his mother, a writing from anything that was the contemporary to his time. Just one piece. Was that, oh, you know what? Well, maybe Jesus was a historical person. That would probably be enough. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think, um... Yeah, this this is harder for me actually uh, to change to change my mind that Jesus didn't exist. Maybe if we had uh, a very early source or something, and it was it was oh, historian saw it as reliable. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Uh, uh, let's just wait for this little audio snafu to pass. It's just a connection issue. It's probably gone by now. But I just wanted to have a chance to say it again because I was having a pretty hard time understanding it. But but feel free to answer. You know what would change your mind. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I guess um, maybe the cause originally I was going to say that the best argument that I've seen mythicists make um, is sort of like um, 
an argument from silence uh, from based on the writings of the Apostle Paul. Um, but again, I was prepared to tackle that. Again, again that sort of fails because of our expectations um, by looking at second century historians' write, writings where they don't mention this as well. So I think any sort of argument based on silence is a failure. So it would really have to be something positive. Like we, we find a very early letter um, purporting to be from uh, the one of the apostles and you know we oh we we bamboozled them we we totally made up this myth about jesus or like something like that um would definitely cause me to consider that evidence and possibly change my mind if it turns out that is reliable and we have good reason to say that yeah this was written by peter or paul or something like that the source itself though you, you would you would feel that uh the original source um from where they're making the claim that Christ existed if they actually admitted that they had intentionally tricked others. That's more or less your point. Yeah, yeah. Like, say, say we find a letter from Paul written in the early 40s AD, the earliest that we have, and he's he, he's talking about how him and Peter and, and all that, they've all tricked everyone and conspired every, um, to invent this Jesus person or something. That, that would definitely cause something if we could prove it was written by him. It is interesting to know that Paul actually never claimed to have met Jesus himself. I mean, Pre-death, pre yeah. Know, whenever, he talk about, whenever he talks about Jesus, it's always according to Scripture, according to Scripture. He never actually claimed to actually have met the man. Except that. Uh, do you, the, the, the spiritual version of him, but that's yeah. kind of good luck or whatever. That wasn't really the same. Which, which is even funny, too, because he'd even wrote the whole the Road to Damascus thing. He'd even read that himself. Which you would think, you know, the, the, the most, the greatest conversion story ever would think which he would write himself, but he didn't. That's yeah, right. Yeah, uh, well, he, and he doesn't tell us anything about his conversion experience oh. as well, right? But Very interesting as well, I think. Who, who's, who told us about the conversion story? I thought that was from Paul. It was actually, no, well, well, it is the story of Paul, but it's actually written in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, if you believe some people think, uh, they think that Luke wrote the Acts, I'm not sure at this point, but, you know, uh, Paul himself never actually wrote about his supposed conversion, which I think is incredibly interesting. Yeah, he, yeah. he, he does write about it, but he doesn't give the narrative details, you know, like, oh, I, I'm traveling on the road to Damascus and with my companions and the, the bright light comes, Jesus appears and um, bodily, not spiritually, I would say, uh, but... Uh, that that comes from Acts of the Apostles, um, but that's not a problem because I, I think we can prove historically that Luke was a companion of, or the writer of Acts, um, which is Luke, um, was a companion of the Apostle Paul and would have known about his conversion story and that sort of thing. Um, this is where I disagree. I think that that's a huge problem. Because you think if something like that happened to me, you ought to be the first one shouting you on the roof. And you guys don't have any idea what just happened to me? But he did, right? Uh, Dale, is there, um, Sorry. and this is me, like, really asking out of curiosity, not, I, I have no point, because I don't know your, uh, answer, you know? Yeah. I wouldn't ask the question if I was trying to make an argument if I didn't know the answer, right? But, uh, is there anything in Paul's writings that describe the event that we could align with it, other than, I mean, does it, does it just say his conversion, or is there something where he was like, yeah, that one time, you know, something like that that would kind of make oh. it seem like, He's confirming it? Definitely, yeah. He, he talked, like in Galatians, he talks about how he was persecuting the church. He, he gives sort of an autobiographical statement there where he's... No, I mean, I mean about how, you know, he's on the horse, he gets knocked off of it on the road to Damascus, and he sees Jesus. Like, does he confirm anything like that? Um, the, the only thing, no. So, so no, not in terms of the Acts account. Um, mm -hmm. But there is, there is something in his writings um, where he does get carried up to heaven, um, you know, some skeptics will say, oh, it's like an NDE type experience. I can't remember offhand if he does see Jesus there or not, but that that's not, that, yeah, that's that not. That would work with Acts, though. Acts didn't refer to that, did it? No. No, it didn't. So, so that is, that is a fascinating point, that, that perhaps that didn't, that the fact that he didn't mention that or have anything... Uh, even referencing that event 
I'm, I'm just hoping Dale doesn't come up with it. Well, you know, in the Jewish tradition, it's kind of taboo to talk about your old conversions. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. I can't make that argument, but... <laughs> just poking fun at you, Dale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Versus no Jews but, ever really wanted to... But, that. but yeah. it, it is, it does argument. come down to the yeah. main overarching point. Again, you're you're getting in the wrong expectations, and... If you want, on uh, skeptic on my show, Skeptics and Seekers, we actually did um, a lot of my opinions on Acts and its relation to Paul uh, comes from a scholar named Dr. Craig Keener, um, and we we did a, a show with your what? Sorry. Say, say it again, Dale. Uh, doc- on your on Skeptics and Seekers, you did what? Uh, we we did a show specifically on the historicity of Acts of the Apostles, and um, one of the questions was his relation between Acts and Paul, because he has an entire chapter in his four-volume commentary on, on Acts. Um, so, so yeah, if, if you're interested, you could check out Dr. Craig, Craig Keener's show, and we really go into a lot of detail as to how do we know uh, that Acts was written by a companion of Paul, uh, what significance do the differences between Paul's letters and, and Acts uh, have in terms of showing whether he knew Paul or not and that sort of thing. Check it out. Well, I'm, uh, go ahead and get out of here, gentlemen. Thank you so much for having this conversation, and uh, I look forward to speaking to both of you again in the future. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Dale. Yep, thank you.